Um, this is Penny Song with Brave and Unbroken. And again, here with Margaret Holzer. This is the Margaret Hello. and Penny Show, episode number, I think, four. Four, yeah. <laughs> and um, we're so excited to be here with you, April Child Abuse Prevention Month and Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And we just wanted to, as two adult survivors of child sexual abuse, share some of our thoughts around some great topics. And Margaret, you have something you want to share today? Yes, I found a fantastic post on Instagram that I really liked um, that talks about how trauma shows up in survivors in different ways. Um, and it has nine different um, ways that trauma shows up in your life. And so we're just going to go over the nine different ways. Um, we were talking about this earlier, actually, and Penny and I each realized that we had seven of the nine things, not the same ones. Um, so yeah, so we're going to go over the nine ones and talk about how they have showed up in our lives. And um, yeah, um, so the first, one, I guess I'll read them all out and then we'll go back and go over them. So um, the nine things are procrastination, not feeling good enough, scattered thoughts, resistance, fear of failure, need to plan everything, trouble focusing or brain fog, trouble asking for help, and fear of success. Um, so let's start with procrastination. Oh yes, I am ultimate procrastinator. And I almost, when I have too much time, I actually wait to the end of it because it almost is like a rush. It feels exciting to wait to the last second. How about you? Oh, that's really funny. Um, I, I'm also a bit of a procrastinator. Interestingly enough, I would argue that that even goes into running late. I know that's not exactly what it says, um, <clears throat> but I procrastinate and I run late. And Running late in particular for me, people have always gotten on my case and said, oh, you know, when you run late, you don't have respect for others. And I would argue that that, that it actually is that you don't have respect for yourself. Um, and the reason I say that is my philosophy has always been, okay, if I'm hanging out with a bunch of friends and let's say we're going to a movie or we're going to have dinner, if I'm late, start without me. Like I first and foremost, genuinely don't care. Um, but I would expect you to go into the movie. If I'm late, I would expect you to start dinner without me. If I'm late to a meeting, I would expect you to start the meeting without me. Because my thing is, is why am I so all important that you're waiting on me? You should go ahead and start without me. And other people look at it and go, well, you're not respecting us in our time. And my thing is, is why do I matter this much? That So it's, it's interesting um, that I would actually argue being late and procrastination both um, can show up as a result of trauma and just kind of not having that value of yourself. I would agree. And I am, um, it was funny that you mentioned the late thing because I am the worst. Um, but what I find myself doing is cramming in so much. Yes. That I'm back to back intentionally, mm -hmm. um, which goes to, I don't know if it's on that list, but just wanting to be busy yep. all the time. Yep. Um, and so I, underestimate the time I need to get to where I'm going. And I think that might be why I like working from home right now. Yeah. <laughs> is because I don't have to be at eight different locations for work in one day or however many, like I can just, I can back to back things and it's okay. So yes, I agree. It's same problem. Um, being late. And, uh, again, it's just my need to fill time. I do the same thing. I am also back to back to back to back and I poorly underestimate how long it takes to get places. So it's, it's honestly, I always try to tell people, it's never that I'm not respecting them. Um, it's, it's usually about me, but in a, in a negative, I would say thing about me, it's not ever that I'm trying to be disrespectful of someone else. Yeah, I would agree. Um, okay. So number two, this is a big one, not feeling good enough. Um, I would say that's probably a, a pretty traditional one. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, that I would say is, has, is an ongoing thing for me. Um, it's so easy to just say on the surface, like, oh, I don't feel good enough. And, and that's something that traditionally people will work on in therapy. Um, but I think everything comes back to that. And it, it sneaks up on you when you, you don't expect it. And I think it comes back in ways that you don't realize. 
But I think that one is such a big one because I think everything is rooted in that. You just, you don't always realize it. Yeah. And did that show up for you being an Olympian? Yes, absolutely. Um, I would actually argue that the number one reason I was an Olympian was because I didn't feel good enough. Um, I had to be so successful in every area of my life just because I, I had, I always call it the pit of despair. Um, but I just had this black hole and I just kept throwing accomplishments down this hole because I didn't ever feel like I had value. And so I just, you know, it, I just kept throwing things and thinking that, oh, if I'm, I'm successful at this, if I get this time, this accomplishment, this medal, you know, then I'll have value and I'll feel good about myself. And it just kind of never happened. And, um, and I, I would say, I mean, that, that still happens. I mean, even, even now, even though I logically know that, that I am good enough. Um, cause I think the thing is, is we, we tell ourselves that we're going to learn something and then we do learn it in our head, but that doesn't always change the emotion. I would argue that my, my default is still not feeling good enough. So when I like someone, if I go on a date and this person rejects me, my automatic default is to go into that dark place of just feeling of not just rejection because I think obviously anyone's going to feel rejected if you are attracted to someone and they're not interested. Right. Um, but my automatic default is to go into that place of just, I have no value. I don't matter. I'm not good enough, you know, in this just really, really extreme manner. And I can logically see myself doing it and I just, I can't turn it off. Like I can't shut the emotion off. Um, sure. And that's hard to talk yourself through, I think. And I've heard that a lot from survivors where it could be all about the other person. The time isn't right, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, but we find that we are, we take it on as it's ours to own, right? And that we aren't good enough. And I think that happens in friendships. Yes, absolutely. Any kind of relationships. Any kind of relationship. It's not even always about just, like you said, a love interest. It absolutely is with friendships as well. Yeah. Absolutely. And to your point, I've had it happen when, when I'm the one who's not interested in the guy. Like, I know that he's not right for me. Right. And I don't even want it to be something, but I but he still like is rejecting me and I still am like, like taking it on. And I'm like, yeah. I don't even want this to go anywhere. Right. Why am I taking this personally? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And I've, and I've had people say where they've had those relationships where someone has said, you know, my time is not right for me, or I've got other things I need to work through or, and that, you know, an abuse survivor, a lot of times or a sexual assault survivor will take that on. So that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah um number three is scattered thoughts that is not something I personally have had a lot of, of trouble with what about you <laughs> oh yes scattered thoughts my mind is 100 miles an hour all the time and I couldn't tell you how many different thoughts are happening at one time and I think it's um I think it's pretty normal I think it's one of those things that happens with some survivors like mm -hmm. you're not, you don't experience it but I think it's just the the constant like I'll be doing something and find myself moving on to something else and then coming back and going, Oh, I totally forgot that. You know what I mean? So I think that's just constant. It's a constant swirl. Um, and again, I think it ties to wanting to be busy. And that's then, fair. I mean, when yeah. you put it like that, I do get sidetracked very easily and I will like when I'm cleaning my house, I mean, this is a silly example. I will be doing something in one room and I'll walk into another room yeah. and I'll start cleaning there and then I'll forget what I was doing back and then I'll, I'll eventually get it all done. But like, it, it'll take me twice as long because I end up doing seven different things at once. So I guess if that's related, then yeah. Yeah, I think it is. I think, and there's, I think there's a second extreme to that. And I don't know if this is on that list, but could be fixated thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. I think like some of those extremes, like, um, my brother is more similar to me where they're just constant random, you know, but I have some survivors that I've spoken to who just get honed in and like down a rabbit hole. You know what I mean? Yes. And I think that kind of falls in the same category, even though it's not a scattered thought. 
no that, that brain fixation. I would agree. I would agree. And and I would I would say I've had that happen actually before. I I've had that intermittently. Yeah. Happen. Yeah. Um, number four is resistance. Um, I I think that one can play itself one of two ways. That one I think can either be the ability to say no or the inability to say no. Um, so like you're either resisting people, you're resisting love, you're resisting relationships, you're just resisting intimacy, um, or, or again, the, the inability actually to resist it. Um, for me, oh gosh, I would actually say I do both. Um, I have never had a problem saying no. No is, is like the one word that I, I learned very clearly and very early and um, I never had a problem with the word no. Um, you know, but, but I think that was me. So I, I, I'm trying to think, how do I want to say this? Like I understood that. And so I, I understood what my boundary was, but that was me pushing everyone away. Yeah. You know, by, by understanding that I just, I was keeping everybody at arm's length and I wasn't ever letting anyone in. And, and I have a, just a very, very hard time letting anyone in and and again that's all kind of relationships that's my friends um you know I I always joke with my friends that um it's like a floodgate you know um you better really like me because it takes a long time to get in but once you're in the floodgate opens <laughs> and you're in you better you know you better hope yeah you better, you better you know hope that that it, the work was worth it because you're you know you're stuck at that point um, but, but yeah, I, I tend to keep people's at, at arm's length and, um, but again, I would say that the, the opposite is I know other people that I think that because sex was not away from them, they were raped, they were abused. Um, they just don't, they, you know, intimacy from a sexual standpoint, isn't, you know, it doesn't have any value. And so they don't resist and no isn't a word that they is in their vocabulary. Um, and, and it's still actually a lack of intimacy because just because you're, you're having sex with someone doesn't mean that you're intimate with them. Um, and so I would say they're still actually keeping people at arm's length um, just in a different way. Yeah, I would agree. And that's funny. You said about the arm's length. I am. Um as a military kid, um, junior high was probably my biggest years and still very close knit with several of them, but that's how they perceived me then. Right. Everyone was this far away. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew me. Everybody was okay with me. Like I was like, I would say I was friends with everybody, but nobody knew me. And I think that's a big deal when you're, um, an abuse survivor, if you know what I mean. Yeah, totally. Totally. Um, Okay. Um, let's see. Fear of failure next. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, that is a good one. Um, I think that I, I, as an athlete, that shows up um, really well. Um, it's interesting. I, I would absolutely say that I had a feel, fear of failure. Um, as, as athletes, people often ask you, I would say, if you have more of a feel, fear of failure versus a love of winning, if that makes sense. And I would say I had more of a fear of failure. Um, winning, I was kind of indifferent on. I mean, yes, everybody likes winning, but um, I think I was more afraid of failing, absolutely, than I, than I took pleasure in winning. Um, and I think that failure some of it was about letting people down, but I think it mostly was, I don't even want to say letting myself, myself down so much as it was fear of what happened if I failed. Mm. Because I already didn't, you know, I already value myself. And this was the only thing in my mind that I was good at. And so if I couldn't even be good at the one thing that I thought I was good at, mm -hmm. what else did I have? Like what else was left? And so it was like this fear of the unknown of 
what else was there because this was the only thing I thought I had, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I so. think um, we also show this, see this showing up in like wanting to be successful in school, grades, overachieving, yeah. um, yep. wanting to be loved and cared about and success. And so I think that fear of failure shows up um, in survivors quite a bit. Um, sports, athletics, home, family, uh, yeah. school. Well, and I think a lot of times when it's abuse within the home, people don't want to let the other parent down. So when they're they're being abused by one parent, they're afraid of failing the, the the first parent, you know, the one that isn't abusing them. And so that that dynamic plays out of, you know, just for whatever reason, not wanting to let down the non-abusive parent. And and yeah, so I yeah, think that's I would agree with you, especially when there's um that grooming and that violence going on. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe not physical violence, but statement violence, like you'll never see your mom again or your dad again or your brother. Yeah. Someone might yeah. die. Um, I agree with you. I think that's a big deal. Yeah. Um, need to plan everything. So you and I were laughing about this one before we started. We were. Um, we were. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely have this one for sure. Um, for sure. Um, so this one manifests itself uh, in different ways for me. So I, in a lot of ways, I'm actually quite relaxed. And I would say that I don't plan everything per se. Um, mm -hmm. But I actually am very, very organized. And ironically, okay, so I would say I actually do plan everything. Um, the people... <laughs> <laughs> how much you how much you know about my planning depends on what what tier you are of friendship with me. Um, if you are a surface level friend, I appear very very relaxed. Yeah, and you would know that I'm a planner because I do a very good job of hiding it <laughs> intentionally. Um, if you are in the middle level, you probably know that I'm organized, and you probably know to some degree that I plan. And then yeah. if you're one of the, like three people that I actually trust, you know that I'm completely neurotic and that I plan everything. Um, and I do, a, I try very, very hard to hide that. Um, but I, I would say the biggest, the biggest thing that I was saying earlier was my number one place where I have to plan things is when I am afraid, when I am nervous, when I am uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And for me, that revolves around conversations. So if I'm having a conversation, conversations like hard ones or it, well, that's what, yes, all of them. So if I'm having a conversation that I perceive to be difficult and that can be something that makes me nervous, that can be with an adversary, someone I dislike that can be, um, with a boss potentially and just a, a, an uncomfortable topic. Yeah. Um, that for me actually a lot of times is when I am interested in someone because I dating is the hardest possible thing in the world for me and I revert back to being like an 11 year old and like my number one thing in the world is when I like someone I like to ignore them because that's what mature women in their 30s do um so when I want to talk to a guy that I like um that falls into that category. So any kind of conversation that just makes me really uncomfortable, I will have the conversation in my head in every possible, not just once, I will have this conversation in my head with the other person. I swear I'm not crazy. And I will, um, the conversation will have every possible outcome it could possibly, you can possibly imagine. So as a swimmer, this was actually, it was really good. I was a swimmer because you, you know, are alone in your head for hours and hours and hours and you stare at a black line. And this is what I would do during swim practice. I'm not joking. I would have conversations with other people and have the conversation 18 times. <laughs> and, um, and then sometimes I, I never, you know, I never needed to actually have the real station because I had it sometimes in my head. Or sometimes I had to remember if I'd actually done it or not. Um, but no, that that's what that's where my need to plan is, is just it's I think because I I hate being vulnerable in front of people. It it I just I don't like being vulnerable at all, period. Um, but I really, really dislike 
showing vulnerable emotion in front of people. Um, even when I'm comfortable with them, I still don't like doing that. So my like worst case scenario is being caught off guard and then getting emotional in front of someone. So I always want to know how I'm going to react, what I'm going to say um, in these scenarios so that I can have my kind of pre-planned response um, to that. So that's kind of, that's, that's why I plan things is so that I, I know how I'm going to handle the situation and I'm not going to have you know, I'm not going to get caught, caught off guard and then be fumbling and going, oh my, I, I, I don't know what to say, you know, and then, yeah, so. So, Margaret, tell me more about this uh, not wanting to be vulnerable. Do you think that ties in as well? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, no. Vul being vulnerable is not bad, but it, it, it's, it's just, yeah. But it's I, a sign of weakness, I think, in, in survivors, in our yes. heads in our head is a survive. Yes. It absolutely feels like a yes. Sign of weakness. Yeah. I mean, it, it would much rather like well up inside to the like explosion point than to give it in the moment. I would rather walk over a bed of hot coals yeah. than, than, than feel vulnerable a and B than show it to someone. And that's even showing it to someone that I feel comfortable in front of, yeah. not even showing it in front of someone I dislike. Sure. Because the fact of the matter is, is someone I dislike would never know because yeah. they would never be able to see it. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. The people that, that actually know me that would be able to see it, that, yeah. There's like one or two people that I like truly feel comfortable with. And even then, I, I don't love it. Yeah. yeah. So, I yeah. Know. Yeah. Total sense. What do you got else on your uh, list? What was that? Oh, yes. Number seven. Okay. Number seven. Um, trouble focusing or brain fog. I don't know about the brain fog, but the focus part, I definitely have that as I, you know, just made my desk stand up because I needed to move around a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm totally focused on what we're doing here and I get honed in and focus on a topic like our April focus for the month. But, um, I do, this kind of goes with the press procrastination thing. Mm -hmm. um, delaying and stalling because I'm all over the place. This one is not one that I have as much trouble with. Um, I, you know, every blue moon, I think I'll have a moment, but for the most part, and maybe again, this was the athlete in me. Um, yeah, okay. I can, I can focus pretty easily and, and it's, I can turn it on and off pretty easily. So that one is not, not something I have a, a super um, hard You're with. swimming, following a black line. I would think that focus would be really important. <laughs> Although you were having conversations, so you figured like it out. Said, to be fair, swimmers were entertained really easily. <laughs> so it doesn't take much. Okay, number eight. Um, a trouble asking for help. Um, that is something I absolutely have a lot of trouble with. Um, I, I think it again, it goes back to that vulnerability of I don't like being vulnerable. And so asking for help makes me vulnerable. Um, it makes me weak. And and I know that it's none of those things, but that's how it feels. And it, yeah, it's, it's and again, I think that that athlete mindset, I have this attitude that I should be able to be she woman and, and conquer the world and do everything myself. And um I absolutely hate admitting that that's not always true and that I can't do that. I hate it. Um, so yeah, I think sometimes it, admitting that I need help um, is, is, is not okay. Admitting that I need help is hard enough, let alone asking for help. What do they say? I think admitting that you have a problem is the first step. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. I think um, asking for help is a hard one because and I don't know about when your situation, but growing up, like you were sworn to secrecy. So there was no way to ask for help. And so yeah. mitigating my own thoughts and mitigating my own worries and concerns was mine to take and to handle, but also to take on our family situation, right? How do I protect my mom? How do I protect my, protect my brother? Um, and so I found that asking for, I still, I mean, asking for help is very, very hard. I love helping. Yeah. But I really struggle asking for help. And I had someone say, you know, loving people is also showing your vulnerability to be able to ask for help. And so I've mm -hmm. gotten a little bit better 
this much maybe. Um, but it's a hard one. I think it's a hard one for a lot of us. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about it, but you're right. I mean, I think carrying a secret, holding that inside for such a long time, you get used to not only carrying it inside, but you're always playing defense. Right. You're always, yep. I mean, you're always playing the game. You always have your wall up and you're constantly just watching everything. I mean, I, I know for me, I think back to, for me, the hardest time was when I was in college because when I was in college, um, nobody around me knew. When I was in high school, my two best friends knew, my mom knew, my family knew. There were people right. around me that knew. So I had people that, for lack of a better word, could protect me. And like I had my defensive team. Mm -hmm. But in college, not a single person knew I was the only one. Yeah. And then on top of that, um, you know, college is a, is a very sexualized environment and, and I was trying to figure out how to, where did I fit in um, without anyone figuring out what my trauma was because I clearly had trauma and I was not acting the way other 19, 20, 21, 22 year olds did, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I was trying to figure out how, <laughs> how do I deal with my own issues and my trauma? Meanwhile, keeping everyone else from, because everyone else clearly knows that I'm not acting the way everyone else is. Right. So how do I keep them from suspecting the real reason? Because they yeah. clearly think I'm a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to make them think I'm a weirdo for these reasons and not for the real reasons. Right, right. Um, so, so yeah, I would say that that absolutely plays. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Um, okay. And then the last one is fear of success. Fear of success is actually, I think, very similar to a fear of failure. Um, they're not exactly the same, but I definitely think they're related. And I absolutely struggled with that one. Um, that one is probably harder to peg because I was very, very successful, but there were degrees of success. And then there were, there were parts of success that I I had a hard time with. Um, I actually had a really difficult time the, when I made my first Olympic team. Um, I had a really difficult time accepting that and feeling like I deserve to be there. Mm. And um, that it took me a couple of years to like come to terms with it for, I don't know how else to explain it, um, but literally other than saying just come to terms with it. Um, I, I did not have a very good swim making the Olympic team. And I just, I really, really struggled with how did I fit in? And, and I just didn't feel like I deserved to be there. Yeah. Um, I also had these really lofty goals. I wanted to be a world, world record holder. I wanted to be an Olympic medalist. Yeah. And when you want to do really successful things at some point, you have to be able to envision yourself doing those. They don't just happen. Right. You know, um, anyone successful at anything can tell you that you have to be able to see yourself doing that. And on the one hand, I could, I could see it from the standpoint of, I could see what I needed to do to get there. I could see the training and I knew I could work hard enough to do that, but I couldn't see myself doing it from the standpoint of like, I didn't, I just didn't believe that I had the the value of doing that. Like I didn't believe that I had the value to be a world record holder because in my mind that that was the most important thing that you could be. That to me actually was worth more than having a gold medal. And so it it took me several years years and years to get to a point where I was okay having that title. And I actually had to come to terms with, with being that good and having that title before I could ever accomplish it and do it. Yeah. Um, and then once I got to terms with that, then I was able to, to go on and do those things. 
Um, but I think any type of success, you know, it doesn't have to be an athletic success. It can be any success in any job. Um, it can be having a, a happy, successful relationship. I think a lot of people self-sabotage relationships, That's you know, true. because they, they don't think that they are worth it and they don't think that they're, they deserve to be happy. And so they self-sabotage relationships. So I think a lot of times it's, we have to accept ourselves that we deserve to be happy. We deserve to have success. We deserve to have these things that for whatever reason, and that kind of, you know, that goes back to um, that original one we talked about of, of not feeling good enough and not feeling like we have value. Like all these things kind of tie in together, mm -hmm. uh, but we have to, to, to feel like we have value in order to then not have that fear of success. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I think uh, the self-sabotaging is a good, is, is a good topic because I think relationships or jobs or school or careers or whatever, um, I think that happens to many because mm -hmm. they are concerned that they're not good enough. But if they allowed these things to happen to them as a child, it's the way our brains work, right? Then mm -hmm. that means that we don't deserve to have whatever in, the, you know, in our adult. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good, good example. And I think it's hard because it's not, it's not always a conscious thought. I never consciously thought I didn't deserve success. You know, I wanted to, to go to the Olympics. I wanted to do these things consciously. So this was, these were never conscious things I was thinking. This was all subconscious. This was all deep rooted emotion. Right. Um, so I, I, you know, it, it sounds all and well to go, <laughs> why would you be afraid of that? Um, so I think it's that, that's where the work comes in is having to, 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 you know, I am a huge advocate of, of getting professional help. Um, but I think that's where putting the time and the work in, um, you know, you don't have to get professional help. I think there's other ways to, to, to get help. Um, that's just my personal preferred method. Yeah. Um, but you know, putting in the time, doing the work, I think that's where you have to start kind of, you know, peeling back those layers, you know, being that onion, peeling the layers back and, and, and figuring out, um, what those subconscious layers are. I had someone recently say to me, um, I'd love to find something I can peel back that doesn't make you cry. <laughs> I thought that was really good. That was really, really good. And I agree with you. I, it, it can be a friend, it can be a coworker, a family member, or a counselor, mm -hmm. but it really, really is important to have someone, I think, um, or some way, books, resources, podcasts, videos, whatever it may be, to help you work through um, the stuff. Because this is, it's hard stuff, and nobody should do it alone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. All right. Well, thank you so much, Margaret, again. Yeah. Um, before, and I just want to point out National Child Abuse Prevention Month hashtag and Sexual Assault Awareness Month hashtag. Check Yay. them out, tag things, and uh, we will catch you next time. Perfect. All right.